Hey, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, if it's your first time with us, uh, welcome. Uh, I hope tonight is a wonderful experience for you and maybe you'll want to join us every Wednesday night. We also have a Sunday program for the Church of the Eternally Secure and I invite you to join us Sundays at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, now, to the regular participants in the congregation, uh, some of you are in the chat room right now. Uh, welcome back. And uh, the moderators, uh, please uh, keep on doing that great job of moderating in the chat room. Uh, we, we really couldn't do these things without your help. Uh, uh, so if someone comes in as a troll, you know what to do. Uh, but if someone is there uh, as a, a first-time visitor, make sure you acknowledge them and welcome them. Now, to everybody who hasn't been here before, as we're going through our study tonight, uh, if you have some input or questions that you want to bring to my attention, uh, I recommend that you post your comment in all caps. I know all caps is supposed to be rude and it's shouting, but in this case, it's appropriate. You can shout out to me and get my attention. So, okay, we're going to get started, but first, let's, uh, let's just have uh, everybody on the the panel here uh, introduce themselves. Now let me start with uh, the, the newest participant. We're so happy that you're with us tonight for the first time. And we got brother uh, Michael, uh, Ultimate Mordecai. Uh, take a minute and uh, for anybody who doesn't know you and what you're doing, introduce yourself, please. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Michael LeRae. My YouTube channel is Ultimate Mordecai. I was a 30 year Jehovah's Witness saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And now I preach the gospel of grace. I try to preach it very radical. The Lord put it on my heart to preach grace the same way that he preached the law, taking it to a whole new level. And so that's my uh, that that's my purpose. That is my ministry. And to let you know that you are joined together to the Lord as one spirit forever and always never to lose that salvation. <laughs> Amen. Fantastic. Yeah, you couldn't say, hear me. I was muted. I was saying, "Yoo hoo! Yay! <laughs> so, yay! Happy day!" Yeah. yeah, that's kind of a real condensed little gospel message right there. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, many of you uh, already know who Michael is. You're familiar with his channel. But if you're if it's you're just meeting him, I uh, uh, Michael, if you're able to post something in the chat room, that way they can access your uh, your channel and they can subscribe to you. So subscribe to his channel and also click that notification. Yeah, I'm not on the chat. I don't have access to the chat room. Yeah. I try, I can't get in it. Okay, well his, his channel is Ultimate Mordecai. So look it up and subscribe yeah. and click the notification button so you get notified about all his, the new videos. He's got one or two videos coming out every day. Uh, and of course, we also have Sister Renee with us and these are the uh, the the um, alter egos of each other, as I say it. Yes. Renee and Michael are like almost carbon copies in terms of what they do on their ministries. Yeah, and then I freak out because he does a video on the same exact thing. Like three days in a row, we both did like the same topic. It was like crazy. Within it's minutes. Awesome, but, but iron sharpens iron. You deliver it in a different way that may reach people differently, but it's the same message and it's just brilliant. I'm so excited you're here. I even uploaded a video to tell my viewers tonight. Uh, I just yeah. did. So in about 10 minutes, we should have some more in here. Uh, so um, I do, it's Renee Roland, channel of the same name. Uh, I like to, uh, I stand and contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints that it is all Jesus. It is by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. And he meant that eternal life is a free gift. And it's so unfortunate the real gospel has been lost because the carnal mind just can't seem to grasp it. They they cannot understand how good God is. So like Michael and Luke and Brother Jason, we are always out there telling you how good God is and hoping one day you believe it. Um, and we, uh, my channel likes to untwist twisted scriptures. Mm -hmm. I try to uh, use the scriptures people use to condemn you and explain them in context. So that you have nothing but joy and you can do nothing but grow in grace and be edified through God's word when read in proper context and rightly divided. So that's what I try to do on my channel. And that's what I'm good at. Not a theologian. I'm a, I, I'm a, what are they? Study soteriology. That's my thing. And um, I'm growing in grace like the rest of you. So I'm happy to be here tonight. 
I missed you guys when I'm not with you. Awesome. Awesome. Amen. Okay. All right. Um, now, we've got already a couple of prayer requests in the chat room. We'll talk about that since we finished the introductions here. But, uh, yeah, uh, it, you probably already know Sister Renee. But if, if it's your first time hearing about her, please subscribe to her channel, Renee Rowland. And we also have Brother Jason Cripps. Tell him what you're doing on YouTube, please. Thanks, Brother Luke. Uh, my name is Jason Cripps, and I am part of a show called True Story Live. It comes on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but I do a lot of these other shows. I'm on this one on Wednesday. Uh, I'm on Talking Doctrine with Matthias on Monday night. And I'm on uh, Steve's channel uh, when he does the shows on Saturday evening. And then I fill in sometimes just when everyone uh, asks me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here as usual doing these. And I, I'm just feeling really blessed to be on this particular panel tonight. So we have uh, a new brother, new to me at least, uh, uh, Michael, ultimate um, what is it? Ultimate uh, Mordecai. Mordecai. There you go. Ultimate Mordecai. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to listen to Brother Luke's interview of him, um, do yourself a favor and check that out and then go check out his channel as well. That's what I did. And I'm getting a lot of uh, edification out of it. So um, I'm happy to be here. Hello to everyone in the chat. You guys are awesome. And let's get to it. Thank you. All right. Um most of you probably are familiar with uh, me and my channel, but uh, I just want to repeat this one uh, exhortation. I exhort everybody to go look at my channel and look at all the playlists. Uh, there's over 60 playlists on almost every theological subject. So I hope you'll scroll through there. When you find a playlist of interest, uh, a lot of effort was put in to produce them. I hope you'll uh, uh, watch them and consider them. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll get started with the study now. Uh, we're the Wednesday night Bible studies. So uh, the first few studies we did were on uh, famous sermons. We, we talked about uh, uh, Spurgeon's sermon, Warrant of Faith. We gave it an A+. We talked about Jonathan Edwards' sermon, uh, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and we gave it an F-. And we talked <laughs> about... Uh, what was that? What was that? A uh, couple of hours of him basically saying God's holding you over hellfire with a string. Be yeah, good. Yeah, dangling yeah. you over hell with yeah. a string like a spider. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then we also talked about uh, Paul Washer's uh, horrible sermon. Uh, you know, uh, um, examine yourself. Uh, and, yeah, warning to America's youth. Yeah. Yes, and, and and we. Uh, so if you if you are concerned about. Uh, John, uh, first John, uh, which almost his entire sermon is based on first John. Uh, we, we discuss all of his, uh, points that he's taken from first John on that. Uh, now, uh, and then since then we started doing a, a study on the book of Romans. Uh, our, it's our intention to work our way through the Pauline epistles. Romans is the first one. So we, uh, if I hope you'll go back and watch the Romans uh, study from the beginning. The first couple of weeks, we did an introduction and the first few chapters of, uh, that are very, very important. I hope you'll watch that because I believe the first few chapters of Romans are, are absolutely misunderstood by almost everybody. And I introduced an idea called prosopopoeia that is, that is essential. When you understand it, it changes a lot of things in terms of how you understand the things that are in the Paul, Pauline letters. And then when we got to Romans chapter 9, uh, I, uh, I it was took great care to prepare for that because it's the, it's the book of the whole Bible that uh, Calvinism is based upon primarily. So uh, we, we used that time to show you how to really understand Romans 9 uh, and refute the Calvinist interpretation. Now we've moved on and we're up in chapter 11 and uh, Tonight, uh, we'll begin with uh, verse 28. So let me read it first in the KJV. <clears throat> As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Uh, let me go ladies first. Uh, Renee? Could you print that in? You usually put it in the chat. Sorry to interrupt. Will you put that in the chat for me, Brother Luke? Uh the yeah. verses. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to do that right now. Thank you. Okay, I'm coming. All right. Uh, 
So he's obviously talking about the nation of Israel here, continuing what we had last week. As concerning the gospel, their enemies for your sakes, meaning they have rejected the gospel. They have remained in their Levitical law system. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sakes, meaning that God has not forsaken them. He has still remembered them. He has called them from day one, and they are still beloved in the father's eyes. And we saw earlier in the beginning of the chapter, he said, God has not forsaken his people or cast away his people that they should fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. Very good. Uh, uh, not much was required on that verse, I guess. Uh, Brother Brother Michael, uh, give us your thoughts on that verse, please. Yeah. Well, I mean, you see that they are like the word enemies is ekthros in Greek. Ekthros means they're hostile. They're hostile. What are they hostile against? It's against the gospel of grace right but for our sake because they're in that covenant of the law they're trying to remain under law but there's another covenant open so if they don't want that covenant or which a covenant is a marriage so for our sake we take that covenant yeah okay very good yeah and of course all the verses leading up to that uh are making leading up to this point here that uh brother cripps go ahead and give us your thoughts Sure. I, I, I probably won't add anything that the other other others ha, haven't already said, but um, I like that he uh, translates so hostile. Uh, so so the Jews are hostile uh, because of the gospel. I completely agree with that. And um, I agree with what Renee said. You know, it's kind of a continuation of where we stopped off last week. Um, yeah, not a whole lot more to say, I guess. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, now. It didn't take long for uh, Brother Michael to introduce Greek to our study. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very, very happy. This is what I expected from him. Yay, this, me too. This is, this is what I am. I'm me happy. three. <laughs> uh, you know, if you watch all of his teachings, you, you'll see how he, he uh, uses it and uh, is, is very, very hopeful. The things that we learn when you, he goes to the, the Greek and the Hebrew. So I'm ha very happy to have that as part of our studies now. But uh, in my case, I've never made a habit of looking at the Greek or the Hebrew. Maybe I'll learn more about it, and and and, and maybe uh, Brother Michael can show me some of the techniques and how he does his studies on that to help me learn how to do it. But what I've always relied upon is uh, I, I always look at the KJV first. I'm what I call a KJ firstist not a KJV onlyist. But after I look at the KJV, I like to look at other translations, particularly I like the Amplified, because Amplified is what we're doing. I just said, amplify your thoughts on the verse, brother, and uh, you yeah. a little, uh, amplified it. So the Amplified translation can be very, very helpful to me, but but also I you always have to be on guard because sometimes in the modern translations, you, you, you have things like, repent of your sin inserted is to just repent so they they insert some thoughts that you need to guard against that so but i'm sure. going to read this 20, verse 28 in the amplified okay it says, from the standpoint of the gospel the jews at present are enemies of god for your sake which is for your benefit but from the standpoint of god's choice of the Jews as his people, they are still loved by him for the sake of the fathers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't find any objection in, in uh, how they amplified that. I think it's helpful because here we see when it says in the KJV that uh, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies. Well, in the amplified, if you had, didn't get the context from the earlier verses, it gives us context here. It says from the standpoint of the gospel, the Jews are, are enemies. So in that way, you can see that they filled in the blanks. So we know who, who, who they're referring to when it says they. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, anybody want to say more on that verse before we go to the next one? I would like to. Go I would ahead. like to. Because uh, like you saying, that Greek is so deep and rich. You know, it continues on. We went over the gospel, but then it says, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved. That word beloved is agapetos. You know how it has the word agape. So if you are the beloved, you are greatly loved with God's agape love for the sake or on account of the fathers. Who are the fathers? Right? We have Abraham, 
we have David. These are the prior saints. David, actually, his Hebrew name means the beloved, the greatly loved one. Love with agape love. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. Now, I, I thought when I read that, uh, uh, it says they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Uh, but I notice that in the KJV, the word Father is not capitalized. And I would think that if they're referring to Father God, they would have capitalized it's, it. I didn't. And it's multiple, that. too. It's multiple fathers because the apostrophe is after the S. Yeah. It and actually I, is Petar, Peter, right? It could also mean patriarch. Yes. Okay, that's good. Because, see, I, I would never have got that it's referring to the fathers of the faith, the, the patriarchs. I would I would have think it's for the father's sake, meaning Father God's sake. Oh, yeah. 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 That's how I thought about it until uh, I heard what you said. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, let me let me go to the next verse first in the KJV. It says, for, okay. This is one of my all-time favorite verses, so I'm excited. Me for too. The, I'm jumping. I'm jumping. I'm jumping. <laughs> Woo for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Amen. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Amen. Yes. And, of course, other translations um, will say, instead of repentance, it'll say maybe uh, are, are irrevocable. Yeah. I like the word irrevocable, irreversible, uh, unchangeable. Wait, Wait till you see what the Amplified says, Brother Luke. You, yeah. You'll be you'll be turning around in a circle and clapping your hands. I'm going to be jumping for joy. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, let me ask. Uh, I'm going to try to alternate who goes first each time. Uh, Brother Michael, why don't you go first on verse 29? Okay. <laughs> the gifts and callings of God are Emma, Emma, Meta, Ameta. You know, Meta, Noia. So it's a, a Meta, Meta, a change, Malitos. A, not a change of mind, not to re be repented of. God does not change his mind. When yes. we change our mind, we metanoia. When God doesn't change his mind, he ametamalitos. Woo! Yeah. yeah. Okay, so when it means he doesn't change his mind... He doesn't repent about this. He doesn't yeah. change. Mm -hmm. uh, so he doesn't change his mind about it being a gift... And, and, that, and that he's going to, hey, it's not really a gift. Uh, I, and I've changed my mind. And now you're going to have to pay for it instead right. of receiving it as a gift. Okay. The word uh, gift is chari charisma. Charisma comes from charis. It's a grace gift. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Brother Cripps? Yes, sir. Now, um, indulge me, please, and read this in the uh, Amplified for me before I make a comment. Because there's, there's really something good here. Okay, uh, I will. It's it says. Um, oh gosh, I've I lost my uh, private chat spot for a second there. Let me pull that back up. Okay, it says, um, verse twenty nine, the Amplified, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, for He does not withdraw what He has given nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. Amen. That's good. Yeah. I mean, I've always used the phrase um, salvation. You have eternal security. Once you're born again, it's irrevocable. It's irreversible by God or by us. That's it. That's, that's how right. I phrase it. Brother Cripps. Yeah. So that, so uh, Michael did a good job of, of uh, translate that in the Greek. It doesn't change his mind. He made that very clear. And I loved how he uh, explained the, the meta, uh, metanoia for us, uh, a change of mind, but for God, it's not a change. He doesn't change his mind. And the Amplified just backs it up uh, quite nicely. Um, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, which means that nothing can take those away. They, they're yours forever. Love it, and he's explaining it right here. I mean, this is this, I, I don't see where where or how it gets twisted. Um, it he doesn't take it away once he gives it to you. I mean, this is something I I learned uh, early in my life, and I would try to explain it to people. It's like if someone gives you a gift for your birthday or for Christmas or for whatever whatever else, there there are no strings attached. But certainly, if God gives you a gift, he's not going to come back and say, oh, you know that gift I gave you? 
I need you to give it back to me. <laughs> That's not right. going to happen with God. Yeah. Uh, now, I'd like to go third this time. Renee, uh, Renee uh, listen to what I'm going to say now because I want to get your feedback on this, okay? Uh, you know, I, I, I keep on saying that the most important fundamental of studying the Bible is first context, and then second is the clarity of, of, of the verses. Um, I, right now I'm talking about the um, idea of we, we, if we want to understand what the intended meaning from the writer to the audience at that time in history, what was the intention that he was conveying at that time, this is what we should try to discover. However, it is all often uh, possible to derive an, an additional meaning from something that wasn't the intended meaning, but it's a spiritualization that sometimes can apply. But we all we have to be careful to not form our doctrine on, on, on that aspect, even though sometimes we get excited about it. And I'll give you an example in this verse here. I used to teach this verse when it says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance to defend my position that you don't have to repent of your sin in order to get, receive the gift of salvation. So in other words, you know, it's without repentance. Repentance isn't required by, by, by you, is how I used to, um, uh, because people are all argue that, you know, you're saved by faith plus repentance. You got to repent and says, oh, this verse says, the gifts and calling you a God without repentance. Even though that, I don't believe that is the intended meaning of the verse, but it's, it's another way of, uh, spiritualizing the verse uh, to make a point. Uh, so, uh, Renee, give me your thoughts. Yep. Okay. I want to say two things. One, I agree with you on this one. This can be a standalone verse. And the reason is because this is a statement about God's character and God does not change. So if God calls you or gives you a gift, they are always without repentance because God doesn't change. So, uh, the context of this is in regards to Israel. So I go over to Genesis 35. We've already discussed Esau I hated. You know, Jacob I loved. Esau I hated, which doesn't mean despise, just means doesn't favor him for this particular purpose, was for the Messiah to be born through, the Savior of the world to be born through Israel. He was chosen and called for that. Genesis 35, 10. And God said unto him, thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called anymore, Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. So we know that Israel was called to be the nation that the uh, Savior of the world would be born through. But we can look at how we are called. And since God's gifts and calling are without repentance, meaning he has called Israel, a remnant will still be his, whoever receives it by faith, because it says they can be grafted in again if they do not abide in unbelief. So Romans 8.30 says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, which we know were predestinated to be conformed in the image of his son, not predestinated to salvation. Them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. And so this gift and calling is also without repentance. How can we say that? Because God does not change. And so even though this verse is in particularly talking about him calling Israel as a nation, as elect for his sake, for his purpose of bringing the Messiah through and their beloved because of the patriarchs and the promises made to them. We can also apply this since it's about God's character to our salvation. Once he calls you and there's a gift that he's given you, which is eternal life, it is without repentance. He will not change his mind. He will not take it back from you. Mm. Okay. Amen. I, want, I need to say a little bit more about this. Uh, Every, everybody had a turn on this verse, right? Crips, I didn't skip you, did I? You did not, sir. Thank you. All right, okay, Every, we've all had a turn. So let me let me comment a little further. Uh, you know, all these years of loving this verse and using this verse, the idea of the calling, and it kind of just went right over my head. I didn't even notice the calling. I uh, uh, the gifts are irrevocable. Now, the gifts, of course, we know. God gives, we have numerous gifts um, as saved people. We, we have the gift of righteousness, uh, the, the gift of, of, of grace, uh, the, the, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
the gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation. These are the gifts that we all have when we believe, and these are irrevocable. This is how I've always understood this verse. But now, because of what you said, Renee, and your love for defending Israel and uh, keeping them, uh, you know, uh, uh, current, I guess, uh, is... Um, I'm an it, evil Zionist witch. <laughs> yeah, it's making me, it's made, it made me aware of this last phrase in there that says, uh, the, the, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now, the calling... I have to go back to um, the beginning of, the, uh, of um, uh, Romans chapter 9. And the, one of the main points we wanted to communicate in teaching chapter 9 is that it's not about personal individual salvation. It's about God's right as sovereign God to choose uh, a, 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 num a series of people that we call the patriarchs, calling, choosing, electing individual people for a purpose and 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 the nation to bring in a particular person's promise the messiah jesus that's what the calling or the election or the choosing is, is about uh but the gift part so i think that in this verse i'm designed to understand it now uh the gifts that we have uh as saints are irrevocable and then the the calling part is referring to uh israel uh, i think you're right about that renee okay anybody else want to add more to that before we go move on yeah, the calling. The calling is powerful, too, in the Greek. Man, my Bible is so full of notes, it's hard to keep up. But it, the, the word calling is klesis, K-L-E-S-I-S. Do you know what it means? It means a divine, open invitation to all people to receive the gift of salvation. <laughs> there it is right there. How do you like that? <laughs> I love it. Okay, would you repeat that? Because I, I, I just missed it. A lot divine, of open invitation for all people to receive God's gift of salvation. And that's what the call, that's what calling is in Greek? Klesis, K-L-E-S-I-S, klesis. It's for calling. That's right. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Okay. Um, uh, any more from uh, Crips or Renee before we go to the next verse? No, but I just love that. That's all I have to say. I just, uh, <laughs> that's that's say. Hey, Brother Cripps, you know, another way of saying that is you just say amen. amen. I did. That wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did all say right. amen. That wasn't enough. All right. Now we're going to verse 30 in the KJV first. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Mm -hmm. Um. I should connect it with 31. Uh, even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. Uh, so I think it's Brother Cripp's turn to go first on this one. Yeah, so the question I would ask myself based on these verses is if, if God gave you mercy because they didn't, they didn't believe in him, then would not the same God give them mercy so that they might believe in him, uh, uh, you know, get a, get another chance to um, change their mind. <laughs> Metanoia, right? So yeah. that they, they would have the opportunity to do that once again. That's what kind of God we serve. His mercy is everlasting. His, it never ends. Um, so of course he's going to, when he, chose this particular group of people when they constantly, as we see in the Old Testament, uh, them constantly turn their back on him and he keeps going again and again and he takes them back and they do it again and he takes them back again um, over and over and over. So I, how anyone thinks that God's not done with them uh, or how anyone thinks that God is done with them, I, I don't understand it based on these verses. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Renee. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like brother Jason, I, I often pull my hair out over this because of people, uh, the, the anti-Semitism hatred going on in the church just makes me insane. But um, here we go. I, I, I looked up something that came to me when I read it. I went over to Acts 18 and Romans 9. First I'll read Romans 9.25. 
This is a, a Old Testament prophecy. I believe uh, O.C. was the uh, city in the book of what's the Gomer and what's the prophet's name that married a prostitute? Hosea. Okay, Hosea. Yeah. All right. As he also in uh, as he saith also in O.C., I will call them my people, which were not my people and her beloved, which was not beloved, which is a prophecy of calling uh, uh, nations other than Israel, his people. And then you can see here in Acts 18 is when this is Acts 18, 15. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And when they oppose themselves, and I like to explain what it means, oppose themselves, their goal is to be close to God, yet their works are opposing that actual goal. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. So you see, if you take that over to uh, Romans, you can see, as you see in times past, have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. So the Gentiles did not believe in the true God, but now they got mercy because Israel has rejected their savior. Even so, these also have not believed that through your mercy, they may also obtain mercy. I think that's also saying uh, that the Gentiles can also preach to the Jews uh, the gospel uh, for to provoke them to jealousy. And then God's mercy uh, is still upon them. They can still come in through belief in Christ. Amen. Right. Thanks, Renee. Awesome. Beautiful, brother. Brother Michael, what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, I, I, it, it just brought me back to um, Romans eleven. If we go back into verse eleven, we're talking about the Jews, the Gentiles, the Jews wanting to receive this mercy, receiving this mercy. Also, it says in verse eleven that may it never be. He's talking about. Will they stumble so that they fall, right? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make the Jews, to make them jealous. To make them jealous is actually one Greek word. I just love going into Greek. It, it, it gives you so much depth. It's parazelio, P-A-R-A-Z-E-L-O-O. -O. It means pressure to provoke to change or pressure pressure to boil over with the desire to change to receive his grace to receive his salvation now everything about the jews i find in the book of genesis with joseph joseph is in egypt Joseph represents Jesus. It's interesting that Joseph is the 11th son of Jacob. And I always talk about that number 11. 11 is two number ones joined together as one, right? Through our heavenly Joseph, Jesus, the Jews and the Gentiles can now be joined together as one with the Lord. They're no longer two, yet they're one. In Genesis chapter 45, Verse four, this is when Joseph, see, the Israelites, the brothers of Joseph, these, they, they represent the ones that are veiled to who Joseph was. They didn't recognize him when they came to him. Do you remember? Because he was unrecognizable. He didn't look like a Jew to them. They didn't recognize him as one of them. But then in verse four, of Genesis 45, Joseph says to his brothers, please come near to me. He shows them and they come closer. And he says, I'm your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Do you understand? This is the entire story of Israel today. They are going to recognize their Messiah. He is going to unveil himself to them. And what happens? They go get their father who represents the entire Israel, and he comes and joins them. They're joined back together, right? The whole story is, is in, that, in that story, Joseph. The whole thing that's going to happen to Israel in the future. 
That's beautiful. Uh, I bet that's making Renee very excited right now. <laughs> you just said, and she's a real champion for uh, Israel. But uh, uh, I have a question. Um, you made me wonder. Uh, you know, they didn't recognize Joseph, uh, but I'm wondering how many years. I don't recall off the top of my head how many years passed from him being sold to them seeing him. How many oh. years passed? Because he, he must have changed a lot. Wow, he was sold at what seventeen, and then I forget his age when they recognized him. But quite some time had gone by where they wouldn't have recognized him. Israel Jacob was very old by then. Benjamin was kind of grown up by then. He was now an adult. Joseph never got to meet his little brother Benjamin, did he? And by the way, the Apostle Paul, who's writing Romans. In, in the beginning, he says he's of the tribe of Benjamin. And you and I, I believe we are that Benjamin tribe as well. Benjamin, is his Hebrew name means the son of the right hand. Or did you know it, mean, it means the son of the south? I, I never knew that when Jesus had his arms out on the cross, his right hand would be the south, his left hand would make that the north we think of north and south as up and down but the right hand is actually the the hand of the south and there's probably some deep meaning in that stuff that i haven't gone into just yet you know unless i really want to go there but you and i we are seated where at the right hand at the right hand so we are that benjamin class okay very interesting Amen. okay um Okay, I guess I think everybody's had a turn to talk about uh, verse uh, 30 and 31. Uh, Renee did, uh, or Cripps, do you want to respond anymore? Uh, no, sir. I'm, I'm all, all good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me let me read that in the Amplified to, just to see how it's phrased before we move on here. Uh, 30, 31. Uh, Just as you once were disobedient and failed to listen to God, but have now obtained mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient so that they too may one day receive mercy because of the mercy shown to you. All right, that makes it very clear. See, that's why I like about the Amplified. It puts it in such simple language. It makes me feel like I'm, even if I was 10 years old, I can understand that. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go back to the uh, KJV for the next verse. And it says, um, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord. Boom. Yeah. Uh, br Brother Michael, why don't you go first on this one? Uh, powerful, man. This just shows the mercy of God. Honestly, mercy is such a beautiful word, right? He shows us his mercy, which also means his compassion. But this, for God has, what does your translation say? For God has, mine says, shut up. Concluded. Concluded. Yeah. For God has. So the Greek word is sug kli i o s u g k l e i o. It means he has enclosed, enclosed them in disobedience. Check out disobedience in Greek. Okay. Api theia, a p e i t h e i a. It means willful un belief so if your bible says unbelief mine says disobedience it means willful unbelief unbelief they chose to unbelief but even with their willful sin unbelief is sin he shows them mercy and his mercy and his grace they both kiss each other don't they amen yeah, yeah. um mercy and grace you know, I'm, I, I might as well use this time here got to uh, make a point about the terms mercy and grace. Uh, I know a lot of times we, we tend to use the terms almost interchangeably. 
But in a way, they're actually opposing ideas. Uh, mercy means that someone is, is not receiving some kind of bad thing or a punishment that they do deserve. That's giving mercy. Grace is the opposite in that uh, you actually are receiving something wonderful that's, that you don't deserve. You don't have awesome. favor. So uh, they're not really interchangeable. They're similar concepts, but they're uh, in one that's way right. they're the opposite thoughts. That's why they kiss each other. Yeah. Not the I same, but they kiss. Just like Jesus came full of grace and truth. Grace and truth, they are joined together in a marriage, right? They're joined together. They're like a married um, 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 couple. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, I'm, I'm thankful. We, we have both. We have mercy Amen. and we have grace. Amen. Amen. Uh, okay. Uh, Renee? Uh, yeah. Let me, we're just doing that one line. God concluded them all in unbelief. Huh? No, the whole verse, the whole verse. 30. Okay. For, for God has concluded them all in unbelief. Verse 32. Verse right, that we have might not that he might have mercy upon all. I pulled up a section in Romans that goes with that really well. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have obtained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not obtained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, which is Christ, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So that even going back to Nebuchadnezzar's dream, where the rock that's hewn without hands, which is Christ, crumbles the kingdoms of all of mankind, uh, great kingdoms, uh, that same rock, uh, the stone that became the chief cornerstone, the foundation has been rejected by his own people. However, God has not forsaken them. Uh, I, I also believe that at, at a later date, his focus will return to Israel. But I think even in this day right now, that there are many uh, Jews coming to faith in Christ. He has not forsaken his people. And I believe that he's really going to let them have their eyes open. I believe this was the plan all along. And I think that's why Paul says what he says next. <laughs> I don't want to get to it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I want to refer back to the study we did on uh, chapter nine again, because uh, I, I had to use this verse in that particular study because the whole purpose of Romans nine study was to refute the Calvinist false interpretation of chapter nine. Uh, but in, in chapter 9, we learned Paul was actually quoting Genesis and Exodus when he was talking about um, uh, Esau uh, and, and um, uh, Isaac. Uh, and so you need to go back and see what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about the individuals. He's talking about the nations that would come from those people. And then we also know we had to understand what Paul was talking about when he talked about the Pharaoh and the hardening of the hearts. So we go back to... to uh, uh, Exodus and, and to see what Paul really meant by those verses. And then finally, the other problem at the end, near the end is how do we understand the potter and the clay? And we have to go back to Jeremiah to see what he's saying about that. But there's a point there in Jeremiah that, that is saying that he will have mercy upon who he will have mercy. It's because the idea is, he, he, you know, he'll have mercy on, on whoever he wants. Like he wants to have mercy on... Uh, on some people and not others, that's God's sovereign right to do it. But then we look at, we jump ahead to this and we see that no, it says, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all, all. This is a, a, a verse is a refutation of a hundred verses to refute Calvinism. Uh, but of course, Calvinism, they first, don't understand Romans chapter 9, and because they don't understand it, and, and going back to the Old Testament to see what it's really intended, uh, they, 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 they then forced, because of their false premise, now they're forced to redefine other words in the Bible, like world doesn't mean world, and in this case, all doesn't mean all. So it says, for God hath concluded them in all, uh, all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. But of course, the Calvinist has to redefine all, because all means all people. 
God's offering mercy to everybody without exception. But the Calvinist has saying, well, all doesn't mean all. All means all of the elect people. Only yeah, and, people. and world doesn't mean world, even though it says cosmos. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the important thing from this verse to me is it, 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 it really is a refutation of Calvinism unless they decide they're just going to redefine the words of the Bible. Okay, um, let me see what it says in the Amplified, uh, verse 32 here. It says, uh, for God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all, Jew and Gentile alike. Okay, so all, all people. Obviously, the Jew are a, a small group of people and everybody that's not Jew is in the other group. The other group is like 98% of the world's population and that little fraction called the Jews, that's, that's a separate distinction. The Jews and then the non-Jews are the Gentiles. So for both Jews and non-Jews, the Gentiles, mercy is available to all. Any more before we go on? Oh, Crips, did you get a turn on this? I did not, but I'll just be real short. I'm glad I'm I'm glad you read it uh, in the Amplified because I I was going to ask you to anyway. So I like the way they, I like what Michael said a little bit better than the way the Amplified says it. Uh, the way that he ties everything in, but the, in the Amplified they're saying the God has imprisoned using the word imprisoned, which is similar to the the word that the King James uh, version uses all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. And as I've said several times in this broadcast, what does all mean? All means all, that's all all means. It, it means all. Um, so, and to tie in again to what Renee said, I, 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 gosh, I would even do a video about this, about this whole Israel thing in, in some way. Um, but yeah, he's, he's not done with Israel. It's ridiculous to think that he is. It was his plan the whole time. Before the foundations of the world, this was his plan. It's not a surprise to God that the, that the Jews were a stiff-necked people. He knew that before he ever chose them. In, in our time, he's outside of time, so obviously he understands the end from the beginning. We know that. We know that that's his character. So, um, yeah, he's not surprised by their disobedience. He's not surprised by our disobedience. We shouldn't be surprised by his mercy. Yeah. Amen. Uh, your, your point, all means all, that's all it means, and is important to get and not, not compromise and change the meaning. I have a playlist called Words Defined because there are so many people to support false doctrine they uh, they have to change the word meaning of words like repent and baptize and all and world and and whosoever whosoever means any person without exception mm. you know so uh, uh, but it's a shame when people have a false doctrine and they, they the, the scripture clearly says one thing they're all, the only thing that they can do is to redefine the words. <laughs> all right, let's go to the next verse. Um, verse thirty three in the KJV says. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and, and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Uh, Renee? I'm pulling up a verse right here. I wanted to add something there. I'm glad Jason reminded us that God is not done with the nation of Israel and that it was God's plan all along as we can see Jesus referencing this in the future in Matthew chapter 8 after the centurion showed so great a faith and yet the Israelites should have known who he was but they're not believing on it uh, but this Roman centurion did and he says to him and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven how do I know he's talking about non-Israelites? Because he says, but in the but the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So they're going to be angry. They, they're not there. But these Gentiles are going to be sitting down with the patriarchs in the kingdom of heaven. But the ones called Israel will be cast in outer darkness. They can't come to the party. And, and he's prophesying that the Gentiles will be brought in. And so God knew all along that this would happen. So when he says, oh, the depths and the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, 
How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So God knew way before he was not shocked by Israel's rejection of Jesus. If you go over to Isaiah, it says, who shall believe our report? They, they know right away that he's going to be despised and rejected and, and that the chief scribes and Pharisees were going to uh, accuse him and kill him. And, and so all along, God knew this, but he's using it not to condemn the world, but to save it through their unbelief. Gospel has gone out to the Gentiles and in his mercy, he returns to, evil, uh, to Israel because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He's called them. He's going to uh, bring it back to them. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So powerful. Well, um, let me uh, change the subject just for a moment because, uh, you know, I said this numerous times and it, maybe I'm wrong seeing it this way, but I, uh, we, we call this the church of the eternally secure. And we started off calling this the church without walls. Um, because it's an internet church. We're not all under the same roof within the same wall barriers. It's an internet church. Um, we had to change the name because other people were using that name we've discovered. But regardless, we, we consider this a church, a congregation. Now, imagine if we all, everybody in the chat room right now, if we were actually under one roof and doing a Wednesday night Bible study, I would hope that everybody in the congregation would be listening to the study and commenting and interacting on the subject being discussed. That's what, what I would think would be normal. But often, tonight I can see it, and, and often in the past, I see people in the chat room off on totally different subjects, totally unrelated to, to Romans chapter 11 and anything we're talking about. And I ask the moderators to, to be, police that and, and get people back on track so that they are on the same page with us. So that uh, you wouldn't think of doing this if you were all under one roof. So let's let's adopt that same kind of philosophy, uh, even though we're on the internet. Now, the, this particular verse here, uh, I don't know whose turn it is. Um, uh, let me, brother, uh, brother um, uh, Michael, uh, verse thirty-three. Well, you know me. I mean, Renee. I love the way she covered it. Love it. I, I like to go into what uh, I like to go in the meaning of words, right? Just to understand. I mean, the next verse, you know, who knows the mind of the Lord? We won't go there, but this ties it in because it says, oh, the depth, the depth. Do you know the word depth is bathos in Greek? Greek is so from, similar to English, right? Bathos is where we get the word bath and it means deep waters, I always talk about that in my videos. You know, you want to get to know God. You want to go to know his grace. Go into the bathos, the deep waters. You're safe in the shallows, but you're not. You, you, are you safe in the shallows? The deeper waters are actually more safe than the shallows. When Amen. it comes to God, right? Because when you read the Bible on the surface, you're not going to understand scripture and it's going to be scary for you. But when you go into the deep, the deep which in the physical realm for us, going in deep waters is scary. But the deeper you go into God's word, it's reversed. You go into the depth and you find out what? Oh, the riches. Riches is plutos. It means to abound in riches, wealth, and plentitude. Plentitude means there's so much it can't run out. Plenty, right? So the deeper that you go into the waters to understand God, you get the riches, the plentitude. Oh, the wisdom. Wisdom is the name Sophia. So if you have a daughter or a friend or anybody named Sophia, her name means wisdom. And it is a feminine noun. That's why when you go back to Proverbs chapter 8, God talks about wisdom. It's a feminine noun. And it comes from God. It actually reminds me of the name Rachel. You know, Rachel was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, who I was talking about earlier, right? She was their mother. Le Leah was the mother of the others. So, Ra so Joseph and Benjamin stand apart. There's a lot that has to tie in with Israel. But Rachel's name means female, ew, ew, E-W-E, like a female lamb, right? Jesus is that male lamb, but we've got a female lamb. 
the wisdom of God. You understand the Sophia. It's you see the God made made man and woman in His image. In God's image, He created both them, male and female. What's the female of God? I've always I've always seen that feminine as the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of God. Right? Some people get mad at me because oh, you're calling the Holy Spirit a chick. No, I'm talking about that feminine nature of God, though. Right? Because Adam and Eve both created in his image. So you have Rachel and you've got Leah. You've got Rachel, that female you. And you see her right here in Sophia, the Greek name Sophia. So that's beautiful. The wisdom. Knowledge is gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. It, it's close to gnosko, but it's not gnosko. Gnosko is an intimate knowing. Gnosis is knowledge, head knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. Unsearchable means unsearchable. His judgments, judgments is the word krima. Krima comes from a judicial verdict. It means a judicial verdict. Is your verdict guilty or is your verdict innocent? Because if God has justified you, dikaios in Greek, dikaios means the verdict is innocent. You know, I, we've been justified. And then I love this word, how unfathomable. I don't know what your translation said, but mine says unfathomable. It's the Greek word. And it's a long one. You ready for it? Annex ichnia stos. Annex ichnia stos. It means how unexplorable. You know, we try our best. We explore the best that we can. But he is unexplorable. It's all, it reminds me of of like people that that they they say they go out into the uh, Amazon, and how much of we of this earth, especially in the Amazon, we haven't discovered, because it's so so deep. It's it, there's places where people just can't travel through. It's unexplorable. It still belongs to God. He reminds me of that. I love this. How unexplorable his ways. His ways is hodos in Greek. Hedos. It's his road or his path, right? That's why we need the light. We need the light in us so that we, on the pathway, we have the light. We don't get lost in darkness, right? Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the, the breakdown of each of those words. Every word on its own is exceptionally powerful, even just in English. Um, we can we can see that that, that uh, the scriptures are saying something, and I would just, let me use the word that the, every word is taking an extreme position. Oh, the depth! Okay, I want you to know how deep this really is, <laughs> and how rich it is. This I'm I'm talking about an extreme thing here. This is not just some superficial rich thing. This is how deep the riches are, and unsearchable. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, boy, we're, we're, I'm sure I can speak in for everybody. Having your your instruction on the the Greek is wonderful and beautiful, and, and going to be very helpful. I'm very excited about having this as as a part of our studies. This verse here, though, is so powerful. They the words that they've used in, chosen to use in English are are like steroid words. They're not just an ordinary <laughs> word. These words are on steroids. They're super powerful <laughs> words. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. And, and when you mentioned uh, Sophia, yeah, I've been contemplating the last few days doing a, a video about uh, wisdom and referring people to my playlist on Proverbs. Um, yeah. 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 And, uh, but uh, I remember years ago, now this, this applies to your experience as a Jehovah's Witness. I remember years ago, Jehovah's Witness giving uh, a friend of mine uh, a verse, I believe it was in Song of Solomon, and it was about wisdom and showing that this is talking about um, Jesus being created, having a beginning. It's in the book and, of Proverbs, uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and of course, my friend was able to, uh, I didn't know how to answer it but that, at that time, but my, my friend was able to show that, no, this, this is not talking about Jesus, this is talking about wisdom. Yeah. And yeah. uh, so that was um, very, very important to get because that's one of the verses that uh, the points that a Jehovah's Witness will try to show. And if a person doesn't know the answer to that, they could be confounded and say, wow, yeah. I, 
I, yeah. I really, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they know each verse to, that's going to confound the, the Christian. Yeah, they, they, they twist things because it says wisdom that he brought forth wisdom. And they say, see, he created wisdom. He created, yes. no, no, God, wisdom was already always a part of God. He manifested his wisdom. Do you understand? By putting it into action, brought mm -hmm. forth. It's almost like begotten, you know, begotten to come directly from the source of Jesus, the only begotten. He, he wasn't created. Right. He was, he came directly from the source of, mm -hmm. right? No. Yeah. Brother Cripps, have you talked about uh, verse 33 yet? Brother Cripps? Sorry, I've been, uh, I have not. I was trying to click the, the mute button and my screen kept flaring out on me. I thought <laughs> um, I, I haven't. And, and here's here's my quick comment. Um, uh, Michael, you said it was the, the word for depth is bath. Is that correct? Bathos. It's bathos? where we it's where it's B-A-T-H-O-S. It's oh, where we get the word bath, the English word right. bath. It means deep waters. Deep waters. Okay, so that's why I wanted to play off deep waters. Now, when he was talking about this, I got all these mental images from movies I've seen in my life of, of people with their boats in the ocean sending machines down to dig up treasure from the bottom of, uh, of the ocean or in the hopes of finding treasure in the bottom of the ocean. Um, sometimes we find it on an island, treasure island, quote, unquote, but a lot of times they're go they're digging deep in the ocean where ships have wrecked before carrying treasure. They know that treasure's deep in the ocean. With God, we know that when we go deep, there is always going to be treasure found there. Always. I love what Michael said about yeah. it. I love that, dude. I love how you added that. It's awesome. awesome. Praise God. Praise God. And you have a video. I haven't gotten to that one yet, but I did see it in your in your playlist. I'm going to watch that about uh, the shallows. You, you mentioned the shallows. In the shallows. Oh, yeah, I even <laughs> sing that song in it. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. We're far from the shallows now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to blame you, Brother Michael. You yeah. are the one I will always think of and blame. Every time I take a bath, I'm going to be thinking of this Bible study now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Go deep in that bath, dude. Go <laughs> I'm going to really bath. immerse myself into it. <laughs> <laughs> Baptize yourself. Deep uh, yeah. Okay. Now, verse uh, 34. Um, this, uh, You're right. It's kind of connected to verse 33. I'm going to read them together here. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Mm. Brother Cripps, you get to go first this time. Who has been his counselor? Who was there when he stretched out all the measurements of the world and created everything the way that it is? Who was there? No one. No one was there. Who's God's judge? Who tells God what he's supposed to do? No one. God doesn't sit in a, in a uh, lay down on a couch in front of some man or any other uh, lesser God and um, ask for their permission or explain what he's going through. No, he doesn't do that. Now, he's given us a portion of his brain in his word, but in verse 33, it says it's unsearchable. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. That's the King James version of it. We can't find out all his ways. Here's the beauty of it for, for, for believers. We have eternity. There's no time. When, when we get to that point, time is no more. We will have all that non-time to get to know his ways even more. That's part of the joy of being in heaven, part of the joy of, of getting to know our Savior, getting to know our Father, and mm -hmm. knowing all his ways. And, and I believe we have that time in order to do just that. The word worship, when I was a kid, I used to feel bad because people would say, yeah, in heaven, it's all just a big worship. You know, we just stand and, you know, I, I got the mental image of it just being praise and worship, which was back then, it was my least favorite thing. I liked the sermons. I liked to to dig into the word and hear that. That was my favorite. But that's not the way I see it at all. We'll be worshiping God in so many ways. 
And one of those ways is getting to know him better and worshiping even worshiping him even more as we see him face to face and we understand things at a different level. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's awesome, dude. Wow. Face to face. I love that. Uh, you know, the way you read the verse and expounded on it, uh, it, it made me immediately think of Job and God's lecture to Job. You know, Absolutely. It, it sounds a lot like uh, God lecturing Job when he says, uh, Paul wrote, uh, <laughs> Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Who can you create a universe? Can you do this? Can you create these animals? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I wish yeah. I had more of that. You nailed it, Brother Luke. That's exactly what, what I was thinking of when I said that. Absolutely. Okay, Renee. That's so funny. I pulled up Job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great minds thinking alike. But uh, the one in Job and Jeremiah, Job 42, 3. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful to me which I knew not. Jeremiah says, great in counsel, mighty in work, for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men. Uh, it also says, every word of God is pure. Uh, he is a shield to them that put their trust in him. And then I have tons of stuff uh, that I pulled up on God's goodness, his perfection, and how, like Michael was saying earlier, isn't your name, doesn't it mean who is like unto God or something like that? Who is like God, yeah. Right. It's so, like the number 11, as he is, so are you. Amen. Yeah. And so uh, this verse here, um, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor, uh, we, uh, there's another verse, isn't David say something about his ways are past finding out or something yeah. like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, God is perfect. Sometimes we, like Paul says, see through the glass darkly. Uh, we don't get the whole picture. Uh, and just like Joseph, we have to endure these trials because God uses all things for the good of those who love him uh, and, and, and according to his purposes. And so God sees the end from the beginning. And so even though it seems tragic that Israel's in unbelief, it's actually God's plan so that the world might be saved and his focus returns back to Israel uh, to deal with his elect so uh even though he knew see i believe uh brother luke that as you do that god chooses no one uh uh, uh for salvation and no one to hell i believe he predestinates all those people that he knew through his foreknowledge because it says elect according to the foreknowledge of god the father i believe he foreknows gives us free will foreknows who will receive him and based on that assign certain people to be elect according to his purposes mm -hmm. like he will choose people for his purposes based on what he already knows just like judas was chosen so the scriptures might be fulfilled that he would betray jesus so uh this is actually all god's great plan it's not bad but it's going to work out and he's going to be glorified at the end of it i think that's that's what it means and when you do the calvinistic way you take that glory from god you take our responsibility and our free will and god always gives us free will i i do not believe anybody is a robot i believe yeah. he chooses people for purposes based on his foreknowledge of their choices. That's what I believe. And amen. He's playing chess. We're playing checkers. He's, he's. Amen. There you <laughs> go. There you go. Like that. Okay. I guess we've all talked about uh, uh, verse 34. So I didn't get to talk about it yet. Oh, I'm sorry, brother. How I could I get to talk about it? I apologize. Yet. I deeply, deeply, enormously, <laughs> unsearchably, enormously apologize. <laughs> I like, well, I like how you guys go into Job. Because you want, hey, Jesus, wait a second. I, should I apologize in Greek? Apologize? I don't know what Greek apology is. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I want, <laughs> I want, to, I want to make go even so deeper. Yeah. Go ahead. So we talk about in the verse 34, counselor. Who tried to be God's counselor in the book of Job? Satan, right? Trying to tell him, oh, he's only, Job's only doing this because you give him a bunch of stuff. You put a hedge of protection around him. You should do this to him, right? Counselor, this, this word counselor is sumbulos. It means an advisor or a consultant. Who's God's advisor? Who's God's consultant? Satan tried to be 
but he can't do it, right? Now we've got, in Greek also, who can know the mind of the Lord, nuos, the nuos of the Lord. This is a masculine noun. Wisdom we have as a feminine noun, Sophia, right? But now we have the masculine, the mind of the Lord, nuos, nuos. But here's what I like the most. For who has known? Now, this Greek word is something that I love so much because you might read it and say, who's had the knowledge? Who's really studied and got to know God? But it's actually, it's an intimacy word in Greek. In, in Greek, it's ganasco. In Hebrew, it would be yada. Like when Adam knew his wife in, in Genesis 3, he knew her. It was the writer's way of saying it's yada. He was intimate with her. When Jesus says, I never knew you to the people that bring their works, their head knowledge, their works, saying hey, we, we, we studied about you. We did all these good things. He says, I never gnosko you. It, it's something that has to do with intimacy because when Mary was told by Gabriel, you're going to have a son, you're going to call him salvation, Yeshua, salvation. And she's like, wait, how am I going to do this? I never have had gnosko with a man. Gnosko is the, the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew yada. It's an intimacy. Who has ever gotten to have intimacy with the Lord, to know him that kind of way? And do you know, the only way you can have this is through his grace. And through his spirit. The, the spirit comes through his grace. That's how you get the spirit. Yes. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, any more on that verse before I go to the next one from anyone? I just want to say I wish everyone would get it when they get a chance to read Job 38. That's there. This ties into what we're talking about as well. Cool, man. No. I'm well, I'll, I'll add, I, I wish everybody, when they get a chance, would read the, the go through the entire um, uh, study I did on the book of Job. Uh, Job, for years, I didn't really feel like I really could understand and justify why this happened to Job. And uh, I think most people could not answer why this happened. And uh, there's a lot to be learned from Job, uh, but... Uh, uh, Amen. I, I, you know what? If I talk too much, I actually it's a, like a spoiler alert. Unfortunately. Well, let me talk. <laughs> let me talk for you. I haven't heard your particular uh, teaching on Job, but I will definitely check it out because it is, it is my favorite uh, book of the Bible. Honestly, there is so much to be gained from it. It there's there's not just one lesson. It the, the to me just briefly, the reason why it's there for us is so a so that we see the sovereignty of God, that that uh, even when bad things happen to us, Satan has to have permission in order to do anything, uh, essentially, to to us. He has to, he, he's not, he doesn't have free reign is the point uh, over us. Uh, God may allow him to do uh, certain things. Um, he serves certain tasks that even in Satan's mind, he's thinking he's doing it to try to get to us. Uh, and in God's mind, the way that he the way that he plays chess is he's using Satan uh, in every way to get his points across and get his will done through us. That's just that's just one way in which Job, the, the, what I see Job as being a good um, one of the best books in the Bible, actually, for me. All right. Now that I know Job is uh, such a loved book by you, brother, I, I'm very excited about you going through the my study on it and telling me your thoughts. Yes, sir. My conclusions. Um, okay, verse 35 in the KJV. Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Uh, I'm going to connect it to the verse 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Let's let Renee go first on this one. 35 and 36, Renee. Yeah, I think the context here is actually referencing Israel and who can say like God that 
can the Jews say, hey, but he owes us. He owes us. How dare he go to the Gentiles and give them? He owes us. And I think that's the context of this. Like, is God unrighteous for uh, having them in unbelief and going to the Gentiles now? Is, is, is Does he owe them anything? Who does God owe? Who can say to God, you owe me? Like, who's given him anything that he owes them something back? The only mm. thing he owes man is the wages of sin, which is death. Mm -mm. So it seems to me that it's it's like saying there is no unrighteousness with God. He doesn't owe you anything. And in any case, let's look at his character and know he's good. Let's know his mercies. Let's know he's good. He really doesn't owe us anything but bad stuff. But because of his mercy, because of his love, he has uh, elected to not bring wrath onto the Israel, but instead to bring mercy to the Gentiles so that through them, they might be provoked to jealousy so that mercy may come upon them. So I think this verse is actually saying, you know, is God unrighteous for doing this since Israel was his people first and have been his people and the Gentiles weren't his people, but who can say, Hey, you owe me something, God. Right. Nobody can. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thanks for name. Yep. Brother Luke, uh, do you would, would you like to comment on that verse? Really oh, sure. Ahead. I think your mic was out. I don't know. <laughs> there was a, there was a long pause. I, I don't know what happened there. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Renee, for what you said. I completely agree with with your uh, take on it. Um, who's given to God? Who who's given God anything? Um, I think a lot of people think that. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm you know I'm doing what God wants me to do. Even even people that think that they're obeying Him and that. Um, you know, it's the, it's the whole puffed up thing. It's like, yeah, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and we're going and witnessing downtown and, 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 and proud Mary's. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that. And there's nothing wrong with telling people that's what you're doing. That's, that's fine. But they seem like they're, they're acting like they, they give God something. We're, we're, it's reasonable service for us. He's given us everything. Yeah. Uh, we, we should be doing everything that we can, uh, for him. Um, but we're, or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again. So 36, here's the point, uh, for of him, through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Everything that we do gives glory back to him. When we let our light shine, instead of put it under a bushel, it gives glory to him. When, when we uh, witness of him and give our testimony and tell other people all the great things that he's done in our life, not because we're great, but because he's great, because he, of his mercy, his love toward us, it Amen. gives glory back to him, and that's what we should be doing. It does it anyway. He says that if we don't praise him, rocks and stones themselves will cry out. I, I don't want that to happen. I don't want rocks and stones praising God in my place. I want to do it for all the wonderful things he's done to me. Praise God. Good one there, Brother Jason. <laughs> Amen. Oh, good. Awesome. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, um, okay, <laughs> Brother Michael. Yeah, so when I when I was reading this, you know, it ends with to him be the glory. Glory is doxa. It means glory, but it also means praise. Jesus actually, he comes from the tribe of Judah, and Judah in Hebrew means praise. Do you understand? salvation was birthed through praise the tribe of praise that's where it came from praise brings salvation praise be brings the victory so now we have in verse 35 though who can pay back who can pay god back right pay him back for what he's given this this is a greek word anta petomia it, or ampi tidomai it means return what is equivalent to how can you return equal to god what he has given to you how can you give to him what he's given to us and when i read that i just had it in me go back to how this all started out and this is in genesis or in exodus chapter 19 verse 8 in English, it says, all the people answered together. This is before Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. Here's, here's where the law 
and the and the and, and the commandments come from. All the people answered together and said, "All that the Lord has spoken, we will do." Okay, they're trying to give back to God what is equivalent to what He gave to them. I'm going to show you in Hebrew. They say in Hebrew, "Kal Asher Dabar Yahweh Asa." It directly translates to every blessing spoken by Yahweh, we will make it happen. So that means here's what that Yahweh, the Lord has, and Israel saying, we can give you equivalent. The blessing comes from Yahweh, so we will earn it by making it happen, by what we do. We are more than capable to make that blessing happen. We will equally give back to you what you give to us. Do you understand? This is where their works came in. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, there are a lot of verses in the Bible that kind of serve as a smackdown. You know, well, Paul says the law is a schoolmaster, uh, to teach us our need for Jesus. And, uh, and the, it says also that the law is there to shut our mouths so that we can't boast. And, uh, and then God says, hey, who are you? you? Can you create the universe? Can you create, do, do this and do that? And, and how, like these verses we've just been talking about, you're showing us the greatness of God and putting us in our place. And I think that many people, maybe every one of us, maybe this is a universal truth. Before we can understand our need for salvation, we need to be humbled. Uh, kind of knocked down onto our knees. We want you know, <laughs> That's right. our pride. So we uh, and we have to kind of be knocked down, and, and then we realize uh, we're humbled and we need a savior. Yeah. And uh, this verse here that I I looked in the KJV, I didn't get it. But when you were talking about it, Brother Michael, uh, I looked at it in the Amplified, and it agrees the way that you were expressing it. It says, or who has first given to him that it would be paid back to him? Amen. That's right. And it, it, there's uh, other verses Paul talks about where uh, uh, how ridiculous it would be to, to think that uh, we could um, receive a gift but earn it. it there, it's a moxie moron. You cannot earn a gift. It's yeah. no, grace is no more grace. Amen. Right. By the way, I'm, I, I'm starting a, 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 a program. I want everybody to get together their best sayings. Uh, and, uh, you know, just a saying like, like the one that Renee said recently, she learned it from the pharmacist store is that uh, a, um, you don't clean a fish before you catch it. You know, uh, something like that, or what Brother Ronnie coined the term license. We have a license to rest. So everybody start thinking of your, your best clever sayings. And we're going to do a, a whole study on just discussing all those clever sayings. I'm compiling my own list and everybody start compiling a list so we can do a study on that. But in this case, uh, the, this is um, making me think about how... Uh, uh, we, I don't like to put impose prerequisites for salvation. You know, people say, "Well, you got to have a contrite heart. You got to shed tears. You got to be sorry for your sinful state and stuff." There's no prerequisites, really. But it also does seem to me that how could a person even uh, uh, understand and recognize their need for someone to save them if they don't realize they're helpless to do it themselves? So there is a humbling of the mind that I think takes place. I'm careful not to impose it as, as a universal requirement for everybody to reach this point of humility before they can be saved. But I will say this, uh, regarding this, uh, this part of the verse here, that the very end, it says, to him be glory and honor forever. Mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, KJV, it says, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, I'm... In some ways, I, I'm really against some of the things that happened in the Reformation, particularly the Calvinist philosophy that came out of it. 
But the, the, the one thing I'll say, praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for, for this at that time. And that is uh, a clarifying uh, the uh, concept of the five solas. Now, the five solas are um, sola scriptura, sola gracia, sola uh, fadia, faith, uh, sola Christos. Sola fide, sola fide. And, yeah, and then, so, and then sola gloria. Okay, now Gloria is usually mentioned last, but I think all of the solas first depend on sola Gloria, because unless we understand that all glory is reserved for God, we are not allowed to have any glory for ourselves. Woohoo! Yes, thank you, Luke. If we do not comprehend that, then we will not understand the other things, because because only. Uh, if if it's because of the grace of God, does God get glory? Amen. We don't get glory because there's no personal merit. It's because we are undeserving and get the God's grace. Right. Uh, and also o only because of our faith in in who Jesus is and his what he's done and his promise to us. Uh, are we saved? Not because we worked and earned it. We can't boast and 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 uh, get any glory. The glory stays with God. Amen. It all. And and also, the, the faith it has to be only in Jesus. That way, Jesus gets all the glory, and we can't keep any for ourselves. So this idea of glory here at the very end is a, is a very important thing for a person to understand. But in order for God to keep all the glory, and there's many verses throughout the whole Bible, we could talk about glory look up all the verses and see the glory is always only for god and the bible says god doesn't share his glory but the bible also says the father gets all the glory and jesus gets all the glory so what does that mean well it means that only only god gets the glory and he doesn't share the glory that means that's a proof for that jesus is god. all right um good word okay um all right we we've uh covered all the verses in chapter 11 now so uh, I don't know if I skipped anybody on verse 36. If I did, go ahead and take a turn. I don't remember now. If you didn't you didn't skip anyone, but if you didn't if you don't mind, I'd like to comment on what you said, brother Luke. I, I was thinking while you were talking about um, how people get to that place of humility and how they get to the place of being humble and you, and I'm paraphrasing you, but you're saying that uh, you have to you have to get to that place and I, I see a lot of people that are believers but but they've never experienced it doesn't seem like they've experienced enough of that being on their back place and i was thinking while you were talking i thought until you've been on your back it's hard to understand the importance of being on your knees huh. is the thought popped in my head while you were talking and just and then all the stuff from my own life flooded back and i remember that up, up until really my late 30s um, I'd never been in a in a place where I was needed to be humble, like I uh, needed to uh, be on my knees. I mean, I was I was a believer, uh, but I didn't understand tribulation. In fact, one of my favorite verses in Scripture is Romans five, favorite chapters, um, and you know it's about what tribulation does. Tri tribulation work of the patience, patience experience, and experience hope. Uh, and I, I knew that verse. I memorized it when I was a kid, and, it, and that was one of the ones that stayed with me, and I've talked about it on the show before. But until my late 30s, I didn't really understand what tribulation actually was. And then when I went through it, I understand more what God was doing in my life and that he was using the tribulation to grow me and change me and, and make me more like his son. And then I understood what humility was. I understood what being humble was. Yeah. Uh, from a different perspective of, of having been on my back to then be on my knees and have that fellowship with him. And it's something that, uh, that brings me great pleasure because of his mercy, not because I'm, I'm great because I, yeah, I'm on my knees, you know, praying. Um, but because that's the place where I'm humble. That's the place where I, I kneel in humility to him just because of who he is, not because of who I am. So thank you, Brother Luke. That it brought a lot of stuff out in me. So I appreciate what you said. All right. Um, okay, we, you know, Michael and I are on the West Coast, and it, it's it's only eight p.m. here, but uh, 
we we've always agreed that we we want to quit at a reasonable hour for the east coast so it's it's about 11 p.m there so we're going to wind it down now and, and kind of and i'm going to ask everybody to kind of take a moment to sum up your thoughts on the on the discussion tonight um and so uh let, let's start with brother cripps i'm just really edified by this whole thing i'm i'm grateful obviously to have uh renee on here and brother luke but um, also having michael on here was great um having the the greek uh and and i think i'm convinced um i've never gone to the greek I mean, when i say never i don't mean like verse by verse gone with greek i've used to translate some things and and stuff like that but um I, I'm really encouraged to do that, and um, I, I, I uh, one of your videos, I don't remember which one it was, but it's when you're talking about the different Bible versions and all the rigmarole about that and how people really get twisted to, in some ways about, um, you know, King James onlyism and all that, and I, I have always felt that and agreed with that. Um, uh, you know, God can reach us through any version, in, in my opinion. Um, but certainly going back to the original, going back to uh, the Greek, and if you can, obviously Hebrew, that would be great. Yeah. Um, but I'm encouraged by you, Michael. I just want to let you know that everything that you're you're doing and you're a part of, just like I'm encouraged by everything Renee does. Um, um, and so to, to be on this panel tonight is just, uh, especially special uh, to me. So I appreciate both of you. Uh, just really quickly, as far as the verses, the same point gets keeps keeps being made about uh, who should deserve all the glory for everything he's done for his great mercy and what he's done for the Gentiles, which is us, and what he's done and what he's still going to do uh, for his own people and that he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he he that began a good work in you will complete it. And that's, that is the truth. That is the truth for me. And it's the truth for you. It's the truth for Israel. So thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, brother, brother Michael, give us your thoughts. What, what, what was it like being uh, for the first time part of a group discussion like this? Oh, it's great, man. You feed off of each other, iron sharpening iron, getting in, in, in seeing the different gifts, you know, that each of us have. It's it, the uniqueness. It, it's so beautiful. You know, n neither none's greater than the other. They just all complement each other. My thoughts tonight on, on this whole study, you know, and, and going through Israel and all that, you know, just understanding, understanding why Israel is going through the patience of God, the mercy of God. They're still, they're still trying to give back to God something to get righteousness in return. They want a right standing with God, right? They're trying to get righteousness. The one thing they couldn't hate, couldn't stand about Jesus is be, he, he, Jesus says, you have to be perfect as your heavenly father's perfect. You know, they, they, they think that if they can just bring their best to God and maybe their sacrifices, it's going to be enough. But perfection isn't that. In fact, you have to have the righteousness of God to be right in God's eyes. How can any of us give something to God to receive his perfection or his righteousness, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. You're made the righteousness of God. And how is that done? Romans 5, 17. Through the abundance of grace, you receive the free gift of righteousness. Israel is still trying to work for, earn, make the blessing happen for them by giving something to God. This grace thing is so overwhelmingly good news and i'm shocked i'm shocked at the people that say they believe in jesus christ but they're still doing what israel's trying to do trying to prove to do something you cannot labor enough to be the righteousness of god it's impossible Amen. Even if you say even if you say you know what well i received his righteousness when i received jesus in the beginning but now it's my it's now it's my responsibility to maintain that righteousness. No, none of us can maintain the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. One false thought, you just blew everything, right? That's why we have to receive it as a free gift. That's why we are sealed in it. And it only comes through the abundance of his grace. Israel's going to realize this someday. Amen. 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 All right. 
Renee? I, I is- am blown away uh, because when I hear him and you, Luke, and, and Jason, everybody here has the same, same revelation about the righteousness of God. And yay, we established the law. It's up here. It's yeah. way up here. We don't we don't make void the law. We establish it. And and we 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 know it's beyond nobody can be justified by it. And so we go out here and we try to let people know it's good, it, it's great news in a way that you can't obtain it. Because that means you there's no point in trying. Stop working. Or you're going to get struck down like the guy who picked up sticks on the Sabbath. When God says rest and you work, it's death to you. Mm. You will die the second death. You cannot work when God says rest. And so when I hear people like Michael, Jason, Luke, Matthias, Daniel, all of them, we disagree on probably minor doctrines. But when it comes to the soteriology, we all have the same understanding of God's imputed righteousness and like Michael just said, basically the same thing Paul said, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You're not maintaining it by works of the law. You have God's righteousness imputed. You can't maintain that kind of righteousness. That's why it makes me crazy when people say you can lose salvation because they think they must be maintaining it or keeping it with something. That's right. And so uh, it makes me scared, Michael. Sad. You say you're shocked. I'm saddened by the amount of people that I believe are not born again, that mock the gospel, that hate grace and claim to be uh, followers of Christ. Yeah. Oh, man, it scares me to death. Right. Me too. And most of my people that get saved on my channel were people already in the church, in the churches. I should say in the churches. That's right. Amazing. I am so grateful to be here. Everybody's got their own gifts, their own way of seeing it, their own way that they bring something to the table. And that's the way it should be. I'm glad we're not all alike and our minds are different, but the spirit gives each person different gifts. And that's what makes us a whole in the body of Christ. And I'm so happy to be here and I'm happy to see you here, Michael. And I, you know, I love you, uh, Jason and Luke. Yes, yes, yes. Love and you. thank you for my viewers that came over. And thank you for the regulars that are in here and the new people. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Okay. All right. Let me uh, speak to the chat room first. Um, sometimes I get a little excitable. <laughs> Brother Michael, you got excitable in your video earlier. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Renee says... Uh, uh, she says, uh, crazy, uh, we crazy. We're, uh, uh, we're, I forgot. I, I'm upset. I don't remember what exactly. Crazy, crazy town. We're, well, we're talking about how it makes us crazy. It makes us upset and stuff. Well, for right. me, for me, uh, it, it, um, the Lordship heresy, uh, it, it makes me angry. And, and there, there is a place for anger where righteous indignation uh, there are many examples in the Bible of righteous indignation, and it is appropriate sometimes. But, but I do think sometimes I get a little bit too excited. And uh, to the chat room, I am, I'm, I hope I didn't come off as too rude uh, when I addressed everybody or like asked you to stay focused on the subject. So I'm sorry if I uh, offended anybody for that. Uh, but I would say that, uh, yeah, there, it does bother us all so much when we when we know what Jesus did for us at the great cost to him, and then that people will lie and twist the scriptures telling us that that wasn't enough. And uh, they might as well just go up and spit in Jesus' face on the cross. That's how offensive it is to say salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone is insufficient. That's how offensive it is to me so oh, this is why we, we get crazy yeah. and upset by this because the scriptures are not only does it say it clearly but it says it repeatedly brother jason jack and i did a series 101 verses proving faith alone so there's a multitude of verses that make the same point over and over and over again mm. 
you can you can look at Ephesians two eight uh, nine and, and, and see it really spelled out very clearly. But the same points being made repeatedly over and over and over and over. And over. So if, if the Bible tells something that's to you that's clear and explicit, and it's repeated over and over, you should trust it instead of trying to argue that something else. And that's why I lose patience when people twist this. And I'm thankful because I think that uh, Renee and and uh, and Michael, you're you're really. Uh, I got carbon copies, as I said, because you're both really doing the same thing. You're, you're addressing the problem of the misrepresentation uh, of the gospel, the false gospel, and you're cl clarifying the what's what true and, and, and uh, you know, as Renee says, untwisting the twisted verses. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So, uh, okay, I enjoyed this, the study tonight, but uh, this is not unusual. Every study we have is, is a great great joy so a uh, thank you to everybody in the chat room for being here and if it is your first time with us uh we appreciate you coming and checking it out as i said in the beginning i, I hope uh, this study this congregation and fellowship is a blessing to you and maybe you want to join us every wednesday uh for the bible study and join us on sundays at 5 p.m eastern for our, our church program uh, we we have um uh, uh, praise and worship music. We have prayer for each other. Uh, we have a uh, teaching. We, we, we do the teaching based upon the questions that come in from the congregation throughout the week. And each person in the panel, we take turns giving our answer to these questions. So that's the, that's the, uh, the format. But we also have uh, uh, praise and worship music. We even have communion on the first Sunday of every month. So many people are, have told us that this Church of the Eternally Secure is, is, is filling a need that is not being met in the local communities. So thank you for being with us. And uh, I especially want to thank uh, Michael for being with us the first time. I hope it's the first of many times we can uh, study together. Thank you for having me. All right. So uh, best wishes to all and bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus. Amen.